Please take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy chapter 4. I'll read the first uh, six verses and then we'll go back and, and look at these verses and bring a short lesson from this portion of scripture on um, what is a Christian to do in times like these. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 1. The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. In verse 1 of this portion of Scripture, the Holy Spirit of God speaks and of course, the Holy Spirit of God is a person. He is referred to in the personal pronoun as He, and He speaks. Today, He speaks to you by His <coughs> Word, and He is the author of that. And He speaks to us that in these latter times, or the last days, or since the days of Christ, and it ramps up as we see the day of Christ approaching, that uh, some are departing and some shall depart from the faith or the faith of God or the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ or the, the Christian faith. And they are doing that because they are giving heed or giving in to seducing spirits. This means that demonic influence is increasing and demonic influence will increase. The Bible speaks in the book of Revelation that the devil knows that he has but a short time and basically woe to the inhabitants of the earth because that the devil knows that and there is an increase of demonic activity and uh, you, you'll you see that uh, around us and you can see it in, in people's lives and so forth. And then in verse 2 he says, speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The conscience seared with a hot iron is referring to the fact that they are uh, beyond feeling appalled by the things that are taking place. It simply means that as wickedness uh, increases around you, that we get used to it. And uh, you see things that are taking place that didn't take place long ago and it, it causes us to get used to that to the point that he is speaking about that their conscience are seared with a hot iron or they are beyond the feeling of uh, being appalled at, at what's going on and so with with that portion of scripture in, uh, the, the whole chapter is just a tremendous chapter and uh, you ought to read it uh, over and over because it is applicable to today. But uh, a short lesson with three thoughts this morning on what is a Christian to do in times like these. Without being overly negative, uh, times are getting worse, not better. And they will increase that way 
as evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse until the day of Christ. Now, when you and I as Christians consider that and look at that from a Christian perspective, it is in a sense encouraging because we know biblical prophecy is being fulfilled and we know that the Lord Jesus is coming back. And so we have that hope, that's the blessed hope, the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now when you got saved, Jesus did not immediately transport you, transmit you, or take you to heaven. As the Bible says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not for the Lord took him. But when you and I got saved, uh, we are still here. And so we encourage ourselves in that. And that simply means that God is not done with you and I. And God has a plan and a purpose and it all revolves around the Word of God. So what are Christians to do in times like these? Here are three words, here are three thoughts. I'm going to simply give you the three words and then uh, we'll, we'll back up and add scripture to these, these three words that are three thoughts this morning. What is the Christian to do in times like these? Now, all of these three words are not in the portion of scripture that we just read. At least one of them is but I believe that the thought is. And so your words are this, doctrine, duty, and determination. And so we're gonna look at that and what is a Christian to do in times like these, doctrine. Well, in verse one, the Bible uh, tells us in chapter four, now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times or our times some shall depart from the faith some are not staying with the christian faith that there is a host of reasons why christians don't stay uh, with the faith and it's usually life difficulties it can be disappointments it can be discouragements and it can be depression and the devil certainly uses depression more than um, ever uh, today. And he will use a life event and certainly come at you with that. He says, uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed or giving in to seducing spirits. It means that uh, these, uh, the demons, the um, fallen angels, seducing spirits, are always uh, attacking. And, and they utilize things that happen in your life against you. And they seduce you or try to draw you away from Jesus and try to draw you away from the faith. They say things in your ear. If, if God loves you like the Bible says, then he would not allow these things to happen to you. Those are seducing spirits. You know it's seducing spirits when it is opposite of what the Bible says. And so if the Bible says that God loves you, then God loves you. And he proved that on the cross with stretched out arms. There's nothing else that he could do to show you he loves you anymore. But when the seducing spirit tells you something opposite of that, then it has to trigger something within a Bible student to say that's opposite of what the word of God says. God does love me. God does provide for me. And my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And so if the devil says this need is not being supplied and whatever that is, you have to negate that and say, no, God said that he would. And so these are seducing spirits and they attempt to draw you away from God and of the faith. Now watch this. And doctrines are devils. And so there are doctrines or teachings of devils. Now there is one devil, Satan, and uh, he has a whole lot of helpers. And so he is not omnipresent as God is. He's not omniscient as God is and all powerful as God is, but he has a whole lot of helpers. And they are devils or demons. Devils or demons are the fallen angels that decided to go with uh, Satan. They cannot be redeemed. They cannot be saved. And so forth so there are angels that did not fall and there are angels who did fall 
and there are the teachings of this, the, the doctrines of devils. And so some depart and they give themselves over to the doctrines of devils. But what the Bible says of that, there is the opposite of that, that you and I as a child of God are to be involved with. And I said our number one word is doctrine. And so this is my encouragement or the plug for that is this morning, learn the doctrines. Learn the doctrines. Now, in verse 6, the Bible says of this text, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and notice, and of good doctrine. There is the doctrine of devils, the doctrine of devils from verse 1, and then there is good doctrine, where the Bible says, Whereunto thou hast attained. To attain to that means that you learn that. And you have to be an ongoing Bible student to get them and then to learn them and then you attain them and then the Lord will use them when the devil comes bringing false doctrine to you. Doctrine is what you know and what you need to know. Uh, it, it is what you believe. And good doctrine, it comes from the Bible. And he tells us this in 1 Timothy 4, 6, good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. You examine your life, you examine your spiritual life, you examine your Christian life, and see what you have attained up till now in, in Bible knowledge of the doctrines, the teachings of the Word of God. Do you have a Bible basis for the things that you believe and that you stand on? And these become your Bible convictions that you will not be moved. And uh, he, he tells us along in this chapter in verse 13, he says, Till I come, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy, or older preacher to the younger preacher, but it is applicable for every child of God. He says this, Till I come, give attendance to reading, and he's speaking about reading mainly of the Word of God, to reading of the Word of God. Reading uh, helps you uh, better than watching TV. Reading, especially the Bible, helps you better than uh, watching TV or, or listening uh, to the radio and so forth because you, you get it through the eye and into the brain and into the heart, but especially into the Word of God. You give attendance to reading and then to exhortation. In exhortation, it is first off exalting God in your heart. That is where most of the Psalms come in. Psalms are songs or exalting Christ and exalting God in your heart. And you get a hold of one of those and you put that to memory because you're going to be under attack in different ways from the devil to bring you down. And the devil brings you down in the things that I mentioned. And uh, I, we have three words here of encouragement, doctrine, duty, and determination. And uh, the devil uses depress, depression to get you down. He uses discouragement to get you down. He uses defeat to get you down. So it is the opposite of what God has for you. Now watch this. He says, till I come, I give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And so doctrine is good doctrine, is Bible doctrines, and, and you and I learn the doctrines. And so you and I need to learn the Bible doctrines to combat, verse 1, or the doctrines of devils to help us to not depart from the faith. He goes on to say in verse 16, now our first word this morning is doctrine, and I say learn the doctrines. In 1 Timothy 4, 16, the Bible says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And it's the good doctrine, it's Bible doctrine, it's God's doctrine, and then he says continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Save thyself here is not in the sense of your soul salvation, but it means save yourself from being one of those that falls away. And 
that you don't become one that falls away and then that hear thee. The best opportunity that you have to win somebody else to the Lord, to encourage somebody else to continue in the Lord, is to be a proper uh, example of one that continues. And because they watch you and they watch what you say, they want to see if you're real or that you're not real. And the devil wants to stop you. Once you get saved, he knows he can't get your soul. He knows biblically that portion of scripture. But he doesn't want you involved in church or serving God or attempting to get anybody else to the Lord. And so he says, now you take heed to yourself. Why? Because of verse 1, that there are those who are falling by the wayside, falling away, and they are giving heed to seducing spirits, the spirits that speak to you contrary to God's word, doctrines of devils. Now, he says here that uh, you and I should take heed to the doctrine, and I said that you and I should learn the doctrine, learn good doctrines. And so this is what we understand. There is wrong doctrine. There are the doctrines of devils, in verse 1. So we have to be aware of that and not be naive to it that uh, just because everything uh, speaks about religious things it doesn't mean it's right. Just because everybody knocks on your door and says they're bringing Jesus to your door does not mean that they are right. And uh, religious and religious racketeers and, and so forth, you have to be careful. And so there is wrong doctrine there are cults and there are counterfeits. And it is best for you to at least learn the doctrines. And then there are uh, good doctrines. It's right doctrines. They're Bible truths. Within that statement, there is the umbrella of the whole embodiment of, of Bible truth. And within the, uh, the statement of doctrines, there, there's a, the whole line of studies that you are ongoing study. And so let, let me just give you a few here and just briefly mention them to you because it is no way encompassing all of the doctrines. But you need to be a student of the Word of God and a student of the doctrines to know what you believe to be able to stand and to not fall by the way and not give in to the doctrines of devils. So I know that you understand that. In right doctrine, these are biblical truths regarding what we would say just cardinal truths of the Word of God. Just let me throw a few out there for the lesson this morning. For example, sin. There is what is called original sin. And it is uh, what happened in the garden. The Bible tells us it's what happened because of it. It is what is ongoing now because of what took place. And it is what uh, affects a child of God. It affects the life of a child of God. And it, what, it's what happens to a child of God when they commit sin and then when they continue in sin. And Baptists are sometimes ridiculed that because that we believe that we are saved and saved eternally, that we can continue in sin. And that's foreign and contrary. Romans chapter 6, the Bible tells us and warns us that uh, we would not continue in sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Bible says, God forbid. And so original sin, and uh, you know that from the Garden of Eden, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And what has happened because of that, and what happens in the life of a child of God in this doctrine of sin. Here's another doctrine. It's salvation. And it's what is involved in the saving of a soul. The whole trinity is involved in the saving of a soul. And it's what takes place at the time of salvation. 
and it's what takes place after salvation and the continual work of God uh, in the life of the child of God after they get saved. Salvation is the new birth, and water has nothing to do with it. It's the blood. It's nothing but the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us from our sins. It has nothing to do with water regeneration. You, you can't get a baby saved by sprinkling water on him. Amen. You can't get an adult saved by uh, dipping them in water or baptizing them in water. It does not wash away original sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And, and, and water has nothing to do with it, but the blood does. Where then does uh, water baptism come into play? Well, it is a picture of the gospel. It is a picture of dying to the oldness of self and rising to newness of life in Christ. It is the first step of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord Jesus did it to fulfill or fill all righteousness as an example. He was showing what he was doing as I die to the old man and I rise to newness of life in Christ. It is an identification with an embodiment of doctrine. If you get baptized as a Pentecostal, you're aligned to the Pentecostal faith. If you get baptized, sprinkled as a Catholic, you're aligned to the Catholic faith. If you get baptized as a Methodist, you're aligned to the Methodist faith. If you get baptized as a Church of Christ, you're identifying with the Church of Christ faith. If you get baptized as a Baptist, I believe that you are aligned to Bible faith. Amen. So it um, doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Salvation is when you repent of your sins and you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And they, they, they do go together, repentance and faith in Christ. And then there is the, the doctrine of separation. Separation and, and what it means to be separated uh, from idols to God. The book of Acts speaks about that, how they separated themselves from serving idols to serve the living and true God. Separation, it, it has to do in a sense with the word that we use sanctification and sanctification means set apart separated means set apart that when God saved you he was extracting from the world an individual who now believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and separating him from the world over to him he was separating him from his father. Most people do not like this. The devil, John 8, 44, and separating him over to himself. So uh, separating is like in the sense of sanctification where you have been set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God saves you, he's saving you out of the world unto himself. But separation is also God drawing the world out of you. That's a process. And uh, you, you, you have the biblical picture of that doctrine in the Exodus. When in one night in the Passover, God, through the blood, brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. That is the Passover. That is a type of salvation from the world. But took years to get that world out of them or to get Egypt out of them because they were always remembering the leeks and the melons and always remembering what the devil had been doing for them and they wanted to go back and they wanted to go back and that is the propensity of human nature. That is what chapter four verse one is talking about. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith why are they departing from the faith? I mean, the milk uh, and, and honey, Canaan land. Why is that? Because they're always being seduced by a spirit saying, you know what you could be doing. You know how this was. And they draw you away. And so that's, it's the doctrine of salvation 
the doctrine of, of separation. On the doctrine of salvation, you, you have to determine within yourself, biblical doctrine, where do I stand on that? Because there is a current onslaught, especially of younger preachers listening to uh, some strong voices out there on, on the matter of a resurgence of what's called Reformed theology. It sounds so good, but it's re-wrapped up Calvinism. And so, uh, within that, Reformed theology, is, doesn't that sound important? Reformed <laughs> theology. If it's new, it's not of God. And if it had to be Reformed, you just consider that. And so, Reformed theology is re-wrapped Calvinism. And in uh, Calvinism, the Bible uh, tells us different from that because Calvinism would say that you are of the elect, you were predetermined to salvation, and because you were predetermined to salvation, a certain group is and another group's not. When you cut down through all of the eloquent speech of God choosing and passing over some, it refers to the thought that uh, God is determined you're going to heaven and you're going to hell. And God doesn't determine that. God died for all men. When he hung, bled, and died on the cross, he died for all men. Amen. All can be saved. Jesus said that uh, you would not come. And so it is the will of man. Now, you put all that together and, and uh, explain it. it you, you, man is complicated, but it does have a free will. Praise God, y'all chose to come to church today. You didn't have to. I realize it's going to be sunny at 50. Praise God, it's not 50 below. Hey, you chose to come, but you did exercise free will. And in the matter of salvation, you exercise a free will. And it's Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14. Now, I won't go over it. I understand we go there again and again and again, but multitude of places for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All the way up to the last uh, book the chapter of the Bible, the spirit and the bride say come. And whosoever shall thirst come. Whosoever let him take the water of life freely. So there's this matter of Calvinism. Uh, the, the, the opposite of that is Armenianism. And it means that uh, you had a free will to get saved and you can have a free will to get unsaved. And neither one of those are biblical because the Bible says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, which shall live and abide forever. And so that if you truly got saved, you are saved. And God gives us the example of a birth for you to understand that. That you were born once and you can be born again. And if you got saved, that you are saved. Here's another one besides separation. Here is the doctrine of service. Does God really expect every child of God to serve him? And the answer is yes. It's throughout the word of God. I understand it's a struggle. I understand that there's the thought of it's only maybe the, the preacher, the teacher, the Sunday school, or, or all, you know, all of those kinds of thoughts. Does God expect every Christian, every child of God to serve him? And the answer is, yes, he does throughout the word of God. And so he gives you certain abilities and certain talents to profit with all. The Bible says to profit with all. What do you mean? Within the, the bounds of your local church. So that's the service. He expects that. And then he determines that. Here's another doctrine. The second coming. And praise God, that's the prophetical truth that has not taken place yet, but could take place at any time. It's guaranteed that it's going to take place. It's the return of Christ, and it can happen at any time. And so what is a Christian to do in times like these? Learn the doctrines. And, and I, I love learning that. And it, it's Bible. And, and those were just a few. It means that you understand from the Bible what you believe 
and where you stand, and you could have uh, go to a Bible verse to, to back it up. And, and I'm not saying that you you learn these to argue with people or to try to win a fight. I'm talking about for your own peace. And so for your own confidence. Man, if I wasn't saved, I certainly wouldn't have any confidence. If I, if I didn't know if I was saved, if I didn't know if I would uh, be able to fall away, if I had to hold on, pray through, and hold out into the end, that's, that, that's not confident Christianity. And if God does the saving, He does the saving. If you do the saving, then you're not saved. But if God does the saving, then you're saved. And so... Uh, the doctrines. Here's number two. I said, uh, what are Christians to do in times like these? Learn the doctrines. Be a Bible student. And uh, if you need a list of more doctrines, they're, they're available to you. Learn the doctrines. Number two, do your duty. Duty is what you do with the doctrines that you know. In verse 6 of our text, 1 Timothy 4, 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Thou hast attained means you learn them. And you have a Bible basis for it. You need a Bible basis for it because you're continually under the seduction of of evil spirits and doctrines of devils. So you need to know what you know, and then there is the duty to perform or do your duty. If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, and it's not just for the preacher, it's for the child of God and in your inner circles and with your children and with your friends and those that uh, call up having a need, that you can remind them Doctrine is what you do with uh, those duties. Look at Luke 17, 10. Luke 17, 10. We'll look at verse 7 for context. Luke 17, verse 7. The Lord's disciples have been speaking to him, and it's about offenses and forgiveness, and they say increase our faith and those types of things because offenses happen, and they need their faith increased. In verse 7, the Bible says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, or I think not. And the Lord has proposed a physical illustration for the people to understand it and so forth. If you had a hired servant, are you going to allow the hired servant to come in and you serve the hired servant, or is it typical that the hired servant would serve you? You've paid to have your car washed. You've paid to have the grass mowed. You, you've paid to have something done. Do you serve those workers, or in essence, do those workers Supposed to serve you is questionable nowadays. But anyway, you you get the physical illustration. That's what he's laying out, and then he turns it into the spiritual. He said, So likewise, verse 10, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. I said, number one, what is a Christian to do in times like these? Learn the doctrines. Number two, do your duty. Does God actually expect something out of me? Not for your salvation. It's full, free, and forever. Praise God for that. But in Ephesians 2.10, the answer is yes. We are saved unto good works that uh, it's been ordained that we would walk in them. 
God has an expectation for the servants of God. And he says, it's simply your duty. It is your duty to perform, not for salvation and not to keep you saved, but because you are saved, because God did draw you out of the world, because God is drawing the world out of you, and because you are a servant, you and I are servants. Christ is the Lord, Christ is the master, and we are simply the servant, and it is our duty. And then, of course, this very familiar portion of Scripture, real quick, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Now, when you find Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I want you to hold your spot and go to the beginning of that book. Shouldn't be too many pages to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I want you to do a comparative study here in like one minute. Now, notice this. Ecclesiastes, does your Bible say Ecclesiastes or the preacher? Yes. Okay. And who is the human penman of this book? Solomon. Okay. Was Solomon the wisest man in the Bible? Okay. He was wisest. And because of what he asked, God also gave him riches above all. Because he, he, he asked for wisdom to be able to lead people. So he was the wisest that's listed in the Bible. And God made him the riches, richest. And he had the tabernacle. He had a good place to serve, preach, worship God. They had peace in the land. Uh, they, he had it all. He had it all. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the Bible says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So he had a pretty good position. He's king. The most powerful uh, nation in the world. He had all. Power, prestige, and all this. Now watch this. Verse 2. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Okay, so you get that piece. He's starting off by saying, before that he gives you all of this book, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, I would have to admit, as a young person, probably about 16 years of age, and, and hearing the preacher uh, say that the things of the world don't satisfy, I said, that that can't be true. This can't be true. But the Bible says it is true. So what you have to do then is live it out to realize it is true. Things don't satisfy. Because he comes down to the end of the book or the end of life and he gives you the rest of the story. And he says in Ecclesiastes and in chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Your, your whole life. He says this. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now that's a summation of the whole book and the whole life. As a young person I said it can't be true. Because if I had all those things I would be happy. And you won't. You won't be happy. Where you'll be happy is fear God and keep his commandments. And then God will provide everything else. But if you don't fear God, you don't keep his commandments, and you have all those other things, you, you won't have any peace. You won't have peace. Duty. You gain the knowledge, you do nothing with it, or you can gain the knowledge and apply it and help others. Now, here's last, and I've only got a couple of minutes to understand that. If you go back to our text, and I realize that each of these points are complete lessons, and doctrine is a complete course of lessons. In 1 Timothy in chapter 4, I said, what are Christians to do in times like these? Learn the doctrines. Number two, do your duty. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. And then last is stay determined 
to finish. The devil doesn't want you to finish. The seducing spirits don't want you to finish. Verse 1, the Bible tells us that. That this is the act of the devil to get you to depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit, Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly. It's like a warning that in the latter times, that's our times, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Because they're giving heed to seducing spirits. And they utilize the doctrines of devils. Meaning in opposition to the doctrines that you are to be learning and to stay with. Determination. Stay determined that I'm not going to be one of those that depart. Stay determined to understand where is this voice coming from. It is a seducing spirit. And don't depart from the faith, the Christian faith. Child of God, determine to stay dedicated to God, the Word of God, the house of God, and His teachings. And by the grace of God, you and I will not fall from the faith and give in to seducing spirits. Stay determined. That's what Christians are doing in times like these. Learn the doctrines. Do your duty. And stay determined. Stay determined. Not going to fall from the faith. I understand where that's coming from. That's opposite of what God says. God is right. And I'm believing, trusting in God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. The encouragement that is contained therein. Thank you for your people. Ask a hedge of protection about them. And dear Lord, that you would bless, help us to not fall from the faith, to be firm, uh, dear Lord, on the doctrines of the word of God, know where we stand. Please bless in the service that follows. In Jesus' name we pray.